be still and know that I'm God. You ever have those times in life where God's just wanting you to be still, slow down a little bit, and maybe see what he wants to teach you? Uh, sometimes we get in those situations, and they're, sometimes they're really not fun, are they? Uh, you know, we're in this series, Relational Jesus, and this is our fifth week, and today I want us to look at something that really impacts every single one of us. Uh, it's often been said that if you're not in a storm of life right now, you're either coming out of one or going into another, and uh, that, that hits home with all of us because we're all in that situation, and we all experience those storms of life. And in this series, Relational Jesus, we're really looking at relationships and how Jesus was the master of relationships and how Jesus knew how to relate to people in any walk of life. And we've looked at a lot of those. Uh, we started the series, Pastor Todd helped us look through the foundation of the relationships Jesus built with his father. Uh, Jesus did everything he did through the lens of his relationship with his father. And then we flowed from there. We looked at Nicodemus uh, was the second week and how Jesus related to the religious leaders in John chapter 3. And uh, a neat fact about that uh, today, many of you know about Elevate Church in San Diego, California, one of our partner churches, one of our church plants with Kevin Campbell as the pastor out there. They are actually, Todd is here in Georgia uh, th today, but he is preaching in San Diego, California they are showing the video of his sermon uh, on Nicodemus from this series in California today. He's probably doing so sometime around now. Isn't that awesome? Let's just celebrate how God multiplies ministry today, and that's really cool. And then we move from there to how Jesus related to crowds. We talked about how Jesus fed the 5,000. And then last week, we looked at the woman at the well and many symbolisms and many things you've learned through that. But all of this was based on kind of one singular premise, one foundation, and that premise, that foundation of this series really is very simple. It's this, and I want you to help me finish this statement off. You got a quiz, I think it was last week, right? And you guys passed it, did well with that. But here's the statement, is that you are responsible for half of every relationship in your life. So make yours the better, better half. You are responsible for half of every relationship in your life, so make sure yours is the better half. Jesus knew how to do that, didn't he? Jesus made half, his half of every relationship way bigger than his half, didn't he? And this, we see that in the Lord's Supper. You see that in your life. We could never achieve the relational status that Jesus did, but we're to strive every day to be the kind of relationship person that Jesus was, the kind of relational child of the king that Jesus showed us how to be in his walk on earth. And that's what this series is really all about. Today's kind of one that could be fun could not be so much fun because we're going to talk about life's pain. And again, a lot of you are experiencing something. I see a lot of heads nodding, a lot of, a lot of heads doing this, this, because you're thinking, man, that, it, it hits home, and God knows what he's doing. Because some of you are in that storm of life right now, but Jesus knew how to relate to people during life's pain. And we're going to be in John chapter 11 uh, for the whole message. So you can turn there, uh, and it's the story of Lazarus. Some of you know the story of Lazarus. Some of you do not. I'm going to give you some other verses about Lazarus um, or about this topic of pain and dealing with life's pain and God's providence and ultimately how that leads us to God's promises and we're going to look at some of those so you can keep your Bible open to John chapter 11 the whole time. I'm going to give you a few other verses as we go. You can jot down. I'm going to give you a synopsis of the story because some of you know the story really well. Some of you do not. Some of you it may be a new thing. Maybe you haven't read it in a while but Jesus was really close. We're talking about relational Jesus. He had a very close relationship with uh, Mary and Martha and her, their brother, Lazarus. Now, Mary and Martha came to Jesus and said, Lazarus, the one you love, is very sick. Uh, and so the expectation was that Jesus would do what he had done so many times before with sickness and disease, that he would heal it, that he would just go straight to it. But Jesus does things a little different. This time, when he hears that, he stays where he was for two more days. Two more days. And he stays there and waits, and then Lazarus ends up passing away from his sickness. And there's a lot of things that we'll look at in the middle of all that about how he taught his disciples and how he taught people. But ultimately, he finally went there, and ultimately, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so Lazarus lived, and many of the Jews who were there with the family comforted them, saw this, and believed in Jesus. But Jesus had some lessons and some reasons and some providence the word providence has a lot to do with the sovereignty of God, that he's bigger than circumstances, that he is in control, that his will is ultimately what's going to take place. And Jesus taught the disciples and us about that providence through this story. But that's the overview of the story. And, you know, there's a big relationship in this story. And then in our lives as well, there's a big relationship between our faith and life circumstances, isn't there? 
Because faith is really dead or useless if you just have faith and you don't see it do something in your life and the stuff that's going on around here. If faith is just here and it doesn't affect here, then what's the point of it? Jesus didn't come and die and we, so we could just have a nice Lord's Supper. We have a Lord's Supper and Jesus came and died and his body was broken, his blood was shed so that our faith would affect our life. And there's a big tie between our faith and the circumstances of our life. In James chapter 1, you can jot this verse down, you don't have to turn there. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he writes about that. He says, my brethren, count it, this is kind of backwards, counterintuitive. Jesus did things that way a lot, didn't he? Kind of backwards from how we would do it. He did that in this story. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let the patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So as you become more like Jesus, as a follower of his, it's these trials, the fire, that will refine you the most, isn't it? But we don't like the fire, do we? A lot of times we have to wait, and a lot of times we have to hurt, and a lot of times we have to suffer, and a lot of times we have to ask why, and a lot of times, like in this story, like I know they were, we say, God, why don't you do what I know you need to do right now? And we look up at heaven and shake our fist, saying, God, where have you been? I've been praying for weeks about this, and yet I don't hear you, I don't feel you, I don't know why you won't help me, I'm so confused, and I don't even know if you're even there anymore. I've been there. Yeah, yeah, preacher, I've, I've been there. I was being called into ministry at the end of high school, but before that, I'll tell you, I went through a big season. I was a preacher's kid. I knew the Bible. I was the kid you wanted on your team for Awanas, you know, for the Bible drills and all that. I, I'd win those suckers, man. I was good at them. I was the ultimate PK. I was a good kid, too. I really was. But I went through a time where, and a lot of you have heard my mother's testimony. She shared it here, uh, I think, maybe a couple of years ago here on stage, but she uh, went through a lot. Life's, life's pain was great in her life, and when she went through all that pain, it affected me. I was just a young kid, and she, was, she battled addictions and depression and was suicidal and attempted suicide. I had to go through rehabs and just such an awful cycle for my family, and my family stuck together through that. And I think I finally processed some of it uh, at a later age, and as I did, I questioned my faith. And I, I'm an inquisitive guy anyway. I don't ever take that. If you tell me something, I'm going to go research it for myself. I don't believe you just because you said it. You're supposed to do that too, by the way. Don't believe it just because I say it or Todd says it. Read it for yourself and study it out for yourself. So I'm that way. I always have been. And so I started reading things that, I, you know, that didn't fit the Bible and, and I started saying, well, hey, some of that makes sense. And I started questioning stuff even to the point where I wondered if God was real, if he existed, and if I ever wanted to serve him. And I said, by the way, don't ever say something like this because you might be in my position. I said, God, if there's one thing I will not do, I will not be a preacher and be in ministry. <laughs> Because I'd seen it with my dad. And obviously the story ended well for me. I'm here right now because God put me. And yes, he put me in positions. And here's a big statement. God will sometimes put you in positions of pain so you can experience his providence and see a picture of his promises in your life. Because of that pain in my life that I went through, I'm here today. I'm nothing special, but I'm being used by God in my life when I get out of the way. <laughs> Because I've gone through those things and just said, God, just have your way with me. I'm going to focus on your promises and not on life's pain. And that's what God wants to do. And that's really the heart behind this story. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. Great book. But he said this in that book. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Whispers in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Sometimes the voice of God is never louder than in the times where you're suffering the most. And I think back to that time in my life when I was gathered in a living room. My mother wasn't with us, and she was a rock and is a rock in my life and always was. Just had this season of pain that she went through in her life. And I remember being huddled up in a living room and just praying for my mom. And God's voice has never been louder to me now that I look back than in those times where I saw him at work. And then now I've seen her come out of that, and I see her live for him every day. And they've adopted what I now call my little sister who's nine years old, and they're changing her world because God let her go through times. Yes, I said let her go through times of pain so that she could lean on his promises. That's really the heart of this story. And the bottom line of this story is, is just very simply this, that God's promises are greater than life's pain. God's promises are greater than life's pain. Write that down if you're taking notes and live on that this week. Chew on that this week. Simple statement, but powerful statement that'll change your life. Y'all ready for the word this morning? Let's do it. John chapter 11. 
the first 16 verses, I'm not going to read all of it to you. I told you the story, but I want us to go back and highlight some of the verses and trust you'll read that this week. But John 11, 1 through 16 talks about God's providence. That's the first thing. We're going to look at three segments. The first is God's providence. I've already told you that providence is just the will of God. He's sovereign. He's bigger than circumstances. But again, in verse 4, we see Jesus changing the pace. Jesus had healed people over and over and over. He stopped. He was relational. He stopped what he was doing to meet people where they are over and over and over. Yet when his closest friends, think about this, his closest friends, he loved them dearly when they needed him the most. He sat around and did nothing for two days. Two days. Jesus did that. What was he thinking? You feel like that in your life. You look up at God and say, what are you thinking? I don't understand. And I heard something said, and I'll just give you a little bit of an answer. And we asked that question, God, why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? Why do you wait so long? You ever feel like God's late all the time? You can say, hey, man, it's okay. He knows, your, he knows your heart. He knows you said it anyway. A lot of times it feels that way. Let's be real. These guys in this story, they felt that way. They told him later, we're going to look at it. But when you feel that way, I want to tell you a statement that's guided much of my understanding of God for, many, for several years now. Uh, and the statement is very simple. It's, it's this, that a comprehended God is no God at all. A comprehended God is no God at all. The way I see it, if, if I knew the answers to all the things, all the questions that I have about life and why God did this then and why he didn't do that then, if I knew all those answers, then I, sure, I certainly wouldn't need God. I'd probably be him. If I knew all those answers, I wouldn't need him. But it's because I don't comprehend God. I can't fully understand and grasp all the things he does or does not do. It's because of those reasons that I need to lean on him even more and trust him even more. So a comprehended God is no God at all. Look at verse 4 of John chapter 11. That hopefully gives you, that was worth coming for there, hopefully, huh? God will just change your perspective. And we, we didn't even read the, the passage yet. Let's look at verse 4. Jesus, when he had heard that, and this is the same Mary, by the way, you see in verse 2, that wiped Jesus' uh, feet with her hair. So just to put it in perspective, you see that in those verses. But verse 4, when Jesus heard that, that he, the one he's, that he loved is sick, he said this, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of of God. Wow, I don't feel like that a lot of times when I have sickness or pain in my life. It doesn't feel like it's for any kind of glory. It feels like it's just for pain. But he said it's for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified. And then it said that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It says that over and over. He had a deep relationship with them. So when he heard he's sick, he stayed two more days. We already talked about that. What was he doing? It was his providence at work. He had a bigger plan. He wanted to teach some people some things in their life. And, you know, God, a lot of times God will walk with you through positions of pain so that the promises of his word can really feel true and look true, not just in your life, hear me, not just in your life, but in the lives of the people that surround you, because people are watching you. They, they see you every day. And I'll tell you this, your influence, your influence is never greater than in times when you're walking through pain. Because people watch you. They watch, you. They, they watch a little bit when you're going through and life's going well. They see how you handle things like that, blessings and whatnot. But people watch even harder when you're hurting, don't they? Your voice is louder then than it ever is before. And I'll tell you this. This is not a story. If I were Jesus and I just wanted a feel-good book called the Bible where people would just want to follow me, I wouldn't have put this story in there. Because Jesus waited around two days. That doesn't sound like a loving Savior, does it? But he had a bigger purpose in mind. And this is one of the things that makes the validity of the gospel. I told you I even struggled with that in high school and coming out of high school, going into college, start, eventually went into seminary, and here I am after that. But one of the things that makes me believe even more in the Bible is the inclusion of stories like this. Things that are not feel-good stories. Things that we wouldn't have put in the Bible, but God put them there because he's a real God. His word is true and real and alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it'll cut right to the heart of who we are. And I believe that because of stories like this. But let's look a little at that providence of God. I love, as you continue on, the story goes in verses 7 and 8. Jesus says, okay, let's go back to Judea. And his disciples remind him of some things. Uh, you got any people that like to remind you of stuff in the past? <laughs> well, Jesus had 12 of them following him around all the time. And they said, hey, you want to go back to Judea? You've kind of already waited. And, you know, if he's sick and sleeping, and I love, it also goes on. And, and Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping, so I'm going to go wake him up. And they think he means, well, he's snoozing. He's taking a nap. He's sleeping. Well, if he's sick, let him sleep. We don't want to wake him up. And Jesus spoke plainly, it says to him, and said, Lazarus is dead. You can imagine how frustrated Jesus must have been sometimes with those guys following around. But they reminded him. They said, Jesus, don't you remember? Last time you went to Judea, they tried to kill you. 
let's don't go that way. Let's go to another town. <laughs> because uh, you know they were thinking, hey, if I follow this Jesus to a place where people I know already, th- th- he's been there and they want to kill him, they're probably going to want to kill me too. And so I don't want to go there. Not there, let's go here. But Jesus said, no, let's go in that direction. And so they remind him of that. But I love verse 15. As he goes through all those things, you can read the details of that story. But here's what he's teaching them. Look at verse 15. After he said plainly, Lazarus is dead. Verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. I read that and I think, man, what about Lazarus' sake? (laughs) But I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. So that, many versions read, or that. It's, a, it's one Greek word that says so that, and it's, it's a big, bold word that says, hey, here's the bottom line. Here's the reason. Here's what I'm trying to say. This is important. So that you may, what? Believe. Don't they already believe? Maybe he wanted to strengthen that belief. Maybe he had more lessons within that belief. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And then in verse 16, I'll just draw attention to that. Anybody have an Eeyore in your life? You know who I'm talking about when I say Eeyore, like Winnie the Pooh? The, the little donkey dude that walks around. He's, ooh, ooh, ooh. You got those people in your life? Now, don't be pointing. I see fingers. <laughs> like, hey, I brought one with me today. One follows me around, kind of like the disciples, right? <laughs> Thomas, the doubter, he was the Eeyore of the story. A lot of people read this verse differently. Uh, and a lot of people would read it and say, well, because well, what he says, verse 16, uh, he said, let us also go that we may die with him. A lot of people say, hey, that was a statement of faith. And it may be, we'll give Thomas the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you can read it and interpret it in different ways. I kind of think it was more of the doubting, sarcastic. By the way, free side note, I believe one thing was left out of the Bible, and it's that sarcasm was a spiritual gift, and I definitely got it. So, some of you got it too, didn't you? I'm just kidding. Nothing was left out, but it should be. All right. It, and Thomas, I think, had it, because I think he was using it here saying, oh, hey, let's just all go and die together. <laughs> But what if we took more of that a kind of approach on a, on a spiritual, that was an unspiritual statement, right? Let's take the spiritual statements out of that. What if we took that approach and said, hey, let's go die with Jesus. What better thing could we do? I don't think that's what Thomas was necessarily doing, but that's what he said. So there's God's providence. He waited, and then we know what happened. Lazarus passes away here, and that leads us to the second thing. God's providence, verses 1 through 16, leads to life's pain. Life's pain. Number two, John eleven seventeen through 37. I'll draw attention to a few of these verses here. Mainly, uh, in verse 25, let's look at that together. Uh, Because Jesus tells Martha, because she said, she went to him, said, Lord, in verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She said, Jesus, this is your fault. Call it what it is. This is your fault. You could have done something about this, and you didn't do it. You said that to God, perhaps, before, too. This is your fault. You did this. You could have stopped it, but you didn't. I felt that way so many times in my life. Jesus looks at her and says, your brother will rise again. Verse 23, verse 24, she said, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection. You've already taught us about all that. But Jesus says, no, I want to teach you something different. And in verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Hmm. Do you believe this? Jesus asked her, but I ask you, do you believe that? She said, yes, Lord. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God who's coming to the world. When she had said these things, she got Mary to come. And I love the difference. Mary came, and what did Mary say to Jesus when she came to him? She came where Jesus was, verse 32, saw him. She fell down where? At his feet, verse 32. She fell down at his feet. She kind of lived there, didn't she? I see her there a lot. I like that. It's a little bit of a difference in the story. But she said the same thing to him. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. It's your fault. Why? I don't understand. And then he moves on, where have you laid him? (laughs) I love this story because it it just depicts real people going through real pain. And that's us. You're a real person and you go through real pain and life is real and life really does hurt. But Jesus hurt with his friends, didn't he? I love that about him. He, He let this happen, yet he sat and just loved them, hugged them. Love the shortest verse in the Bible. Verse 34, verse 35 is that verse. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And then it says, verse 35, say it with me, two words. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, but one of the most powerful, because I want you to think about this. Jesus knew the answers to all these problems. He didn't have to let these problems happen, but he did. 
He sat there two days and then went there. He knew the answers. He knew the scripture. He could have started teaching and just pounding away at the word of God at them. But I want to tell you what he did. He stopped and just cried with them. There's some relational principles we can learn from Jesus in this story, isn't there? One of them kind of ties to our life groups here at Midway. Uh, We train all of our life group leaders to go by ground rules. There's several ground rules. Silence is one of them. Pausing after somebody shares. Not interrupting is one of them. We're really serious about those things. We don't want a teaching environment. We get plenty of that here and in other, other venues. But we want you to be able to discuss and relate and do life together with other people. But one of those ground rules, and this applies, this is a relational principle we can learn from Jesus in this story in verse 35, Jesus wept. It's that, you know what, in times of pain, people don't always need you to fix things. That's one of the ground rules in life. There's no fixing. We're not here to fix. God does that. He does just fine at it, too. He doesn't need your help. (laughs) He'll use you to help, but not when you insert yourself to help all the time. Sometimes in times of pain, the best thing you can do is do what Jesus did. If Jesus did it, certainly it's good enough for us to do. Jesus just wept. Sometimes you need to put your arm around people and just hug them and say, it's going to be okay. I don't know the answers, but I love you, and I'm here for you, and I'm going to weep with you. I'm going to hurt with you. Jesus hurt with them. He groaned in his spirit, the word says. Sometimes it's not about fixing or quoting scripture at people. You may know them, and there's times for that in timely situations. But sometimes the best thing you can do is just do this in a relationship. Sometimes the thing you can do to make your half a better half is just do this and put your arm around them and love them. It's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for me. Another one of those principles is sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody in times of pain is display patience in two areas. Patience in two areas. Number one, patience with people. Jesus was pretty patient with the disciples. He was pretty patient with Mary and Martha who said, this is your fault. You did this. Display patience with people and also display patience in the problem. Display display patience in the problem, with the problem. Jesus waited and man did he wait. It felt like an eternity, I know. Display patience with people that are going through times of pain, but display patience with the problem. Sometimes you just have to wait. I am an impatient person, I'll be honest with you. I don't like waiting. I don't like waiting in line. I don't like waiting uh, in my vehicle. I don't like like waiting, period. I can give you a big list. I don't like waiting. And sometimes God's delays, in this case, they said, Jesus, you're delayed. You're late. Sometimes God's delays are the things he needs to teach us the biggest things in our life, aren't they? I want to give you a statement I want you to write down when it comes to this, is that God's delays are not God's denials. A lot of times when God delays things, God, you're supposed to be moving right now. (laughs) Come on, you're you're slow. Let me drag you forward, God, right? Like we can do that. You come forward and join the party, and God's already been way ahead of you. And I want to tell you, just because it feels like you're being denied by God, there's times in your life you won't feel God's presence. There's times in life where you won't feel like God's right beside you, but yet you know he promised he'll never leave you or forsake you. I want to tell you, God's delays are not God's denials. You look in the Bible at all the the seeming denials, but the delays. You think about Joseph. We just did a series on Joseph. He's in prison all that time. He didn't do anything wrong. He did some stupid things. He made his brothers mad and kind of prodded and provoked them, I guess, in a few ways. But, I mean, he really didn't do anything that bad, right? But God was teaching him some stuff. He went from a pit to prison, and then he was the prime minister in Egypt. But that took a long time. God's delays are not God's denials. God had a plan that was in motion. So many examples of that in Scripture. I want to tell you, when it comes to this question of God allowing bad things to happen to good people, first of all, there aren't any good people, and God is not fair. It's like, God, why don't you just be fair in this? If, it, if you're fair, this would happen to a worse person. Well, I'm, I'll tell you this. I'm glad God's not fair, because if God was fair, we wouldn't be doing the Lord's Supper today. If God was fair, none of us would be here today. If God was fair, we would all be in hell. But God's not fair, and he lets us. That's why James said, count it all joy, my brethren, when you go through various trials. Count it joy, because we get to go through life's pain. God's providence will give way to life's pain so that we can see a picture, a real and tangible picture of God's promises in our life. That's what God wants to teach us today, and I don't know how it applies to you, but it applies to me pretty often. And then we see it throughout this story. Jesus wept with them. He let them hurt, and he hurt with them, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. But here's what eventually happened. 
we see God's providence give way to life's pain, but ultimately he wanted to teach them about God's promises. And so let's look at verses 38 through 45. I'm going to point out a couple of verses there. Starting in verse 38, we see God's promises here. Then Jesus, again, again, groaning in himself, he was hurting, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for days. If you've got a King James version, it says, the body stinketh. You can laugh, it's all right. Because it, it, we, we sugarcoat it, and it's like, well, he's, he's dead, we're moving on. She would say, no, if we roll that stone away, you're going to run everybody out of here. He stinks. You're way late, in case you forgot. <laughs> the body stinks. And you know, I love this, this part of the story because I think about my own life, and I think, man, there's been so many times where I just stink. <laughs> I'm like a tomb that has a dead body in it. When I look at the skeletons in my closet, and hopefully you can identify with me on this, you look at your past, and Satan, he'll remind you of those skeletons too, won't he? And you think, man, I just stink. I'm like a tomb. Jesus couldn't love me. And I love that Jesus, you look at what happened there. He said, I don't care. Roll it away. I'm not afraid of the smell. I'm not afraid of the stench. We stink, but you need to know today, and you need to hear this. Jesus is not afraid of the skeletons in your closet. He's not afraid of your past. He's not afraid of the smell that comes from your life. Look at your neighbor and say, you stinketh. Go ahead. Y'all right. can have some fun with it. It's all right. <laughs> some of you are having a little too much fun with it is the problem. But <laughs> Jesus is not afraid of the bad stuff in your life. He's bigger than the bad stuff in your life. And no smell, no skeleton can ever run him away from you. I love verse 44, how this story continues. We'll skip down a couple of verses. Verse 40. Let's start with verse 40. Did I not say to you? That if you believe, you would see the glory of God. 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, again, a delay. Gosh, I mean, I would just be saying, move on, Jesus. Move on, let's do this. But again, he slows down and he says, Father. And I could imagine him pausing like that and everybody being like, come on, come on. What are you going to do? Let's do this. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And that I know you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this that they may believe that you sent me. I want to tell you this. A lot of times the delays you experience in your life where God's not moving like you think he should, it's not always because you're not ready. Hear me. It's not always because you're not ready that he's not moving. It's, it may be because the people around you in your life are not yet listening or watching. And so God may delay so he can radically change and transform their life. That's what he was doing here. Again, he prayed. Again, he delayed. But then after that, finally, now, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. And he didn't go, hey, Lazarus, come on out, man. He didn't do that. He said, Lazarus, come forth. With a loud voice, he cried out and said, Lazarus, come out. The time had come. Lazarus came out of the tomb. And I love what happened next in verse 44. And he was dead, came out bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. There's a walking mummy here. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Standing by. I'll tell you this. Before I read the rest of the, the verse, I would not have been the first one to go and unwrap him. I'll tell you that. I'll, I'll give you that. But here's what he said. I can't believe you had to ask this, and Scripture even records it here. And his face was wrapped with cloth. So Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. But Jesus had to watch that happen and say, hey, go let him free. But you know, let's tie this to us for a minute. I think we're like those mummies sometimes walking around with old past dead death hanging all around us. And we hold on to that old us when Jesus has given us a new us, a new creation. We're in a new covenant. We have a new life because we've been born again because of our relationship with him. But we walk around with grave clothes on. And sometimes Jesus just needs this. It's at the voice of Jesus when freedom happens. And he said, take those clothes off. Let him go free. I, I just think about that picture. I definitely wouldn't have been that first guy, but I always wonder. Um, I probably read way too much into it, but y'all humor me for a minute. I always wonder, did Lazarus come out of the tomb, you know, and go, and just walk right into the rock? I mean, what did he do? Did he come out stammering around? I don't know, but I cannot imagine the moment to see a dead man come out of the tomb, been dead four days. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews, a lot of times we just skip over this verse and we celebrate. We say, yay, it's over, it happened, great story, but... I love how this, this verse ends, or actually I, I don't. I'm puzzled by it, that word many. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Why does it say many? If I had seen all those things, I wouldn't be a part of, I wouldn't be outside of that many. I don't know about you. I would like to think that, but yet I look at this and I see 
a story where many people, several people that saw all these things, they didn't believe. Some of you are outside of the many today, too. You've been seeing God's providence for years. You've been seeing life's pain for years. You've seen God's promises. You've seen it today at this service, but you still don't believe. I believe, I believe today is the day that your salvation is going to come about. I believe God's going to save you today. I know there's some of you here, and I'm going to give you a chance to do that in just a few minutes as we wrap things up here for just a minute. But I want to give you a few promises of God as we wrap up. Write these down if you're taking notes. A couple of scriptures, a couple of promises. Number one, he is faithful. Promises about God. Number one, he's faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. 2 Timothy 2.13. It says if we're faithless, he remains faithful. He's faithful. A lot of you don't feel like he's very faithful right now. You don't feel very faithful right now, but I want you to know he is faithful. He's faithful. Number two, he's constant. He is constant. Hebrews 13, 8. Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's constant. He's never changing. He's a foundation. He's a rock that you can build your life on, and he's faithful. Number three, his love never, ever, ever, ever fails. His love never fails. Psalm 136 and verse 1 reminds us of that. His love never fails. Philip Yancey said, there's only one thing worse than disappointment with God. And we've all been disappointed with God. I think you would agree with me. There's only one thing worse than disappointment with God. It's disappointment without God. I want to challenge you today. Don't face disappointment. Don't face life's pain. When God's providence leads you to life's pain, don't face that pain through disappointment without God. Go through that disappointment with God on your side because he's there, he's faithful, he's constant, and his love will never fail you. It'll get you through anything. Some of you needed to hear that today. I needed that this week. And God's reminded me constantly this week that his love never fails. He's constant, and he's faithful, and he's never gonna change. And you can hold on to that today. You can never forget that even when life tells you to. Over and over, when life's pain overwhelms you, you can say, I'm not going to fall because I have a God who is constant and faithful and his love never fails. Let that guide your week and see what kind of week it is. See how your relationships are impacted by letting that guide your week. One final statement. This sums the whole thing up today. We talked about how God's, God's promises are greater than life's pain, but this sums all of it up, this whole story. It's that God's providence will sometimes lead to life's pain. So you can see a picture of God's promises. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. It's not easy to be okay with that, but I'm okay with that because Jesus walked through the valley with me, for me, before me. He was there, and he's there now, and he wants to walk with us and help us along that path. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a minute. Nobody look around. Very serious moment. I'm going to talk to two groups of people. First of all, if you're a Christian today, you know Jesus, you have that relationship, you Maybe you're going through some of life's pain, and it hurts. You don't know how to respond, and you just need to take a few minutes to lean on God's promises for a minute and just let him minister to you. And I want to tell you this. Jesus was made more famous because Lazarus died than he ever could have been made famous if he was still alive. And Jesus didn't get to go through those steps of teaching and raising him from the dead. You can make Jesus more famous in your life by faithfully going through the fire than any other time in your life. We would be willing to do that as a believer and a follower of his. But I want to talk more importantly than anything else today to those of you who don't know Jesus. You're like those people, the Jews who saw this. And it says only many of them, many of them believe because they saw what Jesus was doing. You're still outside of that many and you would say, I've seen Jesus at work. I've seen him today. I feel him tugging at me right now, but I still don't believe. But today's my day. Some of you need to take that step right now in this place. You need to say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I'm a sinner. I stink. Just tell him, be real, because it's true. We do, and we're separated from God because we're saying, Jesus, I believe you died for me to pay for my sins, a price I couldn't pay. Jesus, I want to give you every ounce of me right now, all of me, not some, but all of me in this place. Some of you need to take that step right now. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's not about words. It's not about a prayer. It's just about your heart being fully turned to God. I want to give you just a moment to do that. Pray something like this from your heart. If you don't know, you go to heaven if you were to die today. Say, Jesus, I do need you. My heart's broken today as I experience your love. Will you please save me? Wash away my every sin. Forgive me. I know you're alive. Live in me. I give you me. All of me. 
this day forward on March the 30th, 2014. I'm yours.